On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina struck the city of New Orleans. The storm and ensuing flood affected every direct support professional in New Orleans and all of the people with disabilities who received their services. We had staff take folks with disabilities with them and their families. And these were entry-level staff. They took it upon themselves to take care of people in the darkest hours. And it was in the darkest hour for them, yet there they were helping others. And I will never, ever, ever forget that. The people with disabilities supported by Volunteers of America made it out of the city safely, but not everyone was as fortunate. An estimated 90,000 people were still in New Orleans when the hurricane made landfall. I've seen a lot of stuff on TV about why didn't folks just go? How did they end up at the Superdome or the Convention Center? Well, you end up there because you don't have a car. You don't have a car because you don't make enough money to make ends meet. Or you don't have a car that will drive, you know, eight or ten hours to get away from the city or sit in traffic for eight or ten hours on the interstate in gridlock when you're supposed to be leaving to higher ground. As with previous evacuations, people thought they would be returning home after three days. But this was not the case. That Monday morning when we got up, started watching TV, and I mean, to our surprise, well, we were shocked when we saw that, you know, there was no more in New Orleans. Supporting people during the ongoing evacuation, as well as supporting family members, created new financial burdens for DSPs. Many used personal credit cards and spent their savings taking care of the people they supported. By this time, our staff, they were ragged, but they kept plugging away and, and they kept doing their job, even though I can't even begin to imagine what might have been going through their minds about what, what's happened to my husband, my sons, my daughters, my grandchildren. One DSP, supporting a man who used a wheelchair, tried valiantly to save his friend. Indeed, the direct support worker and the person who used the wheelchair did not evacuate from the house. As the water rose, they tried to go up into the attic and um, they couldn't get there. Chad was like my little brother, a big time prankster. Chad caught a goal a simple cold from one of his frat brothers. He checked himself into the hospital. I was there with him. And um, he just got sicker and sicker. His medical records were at Tulane Hospital, which was flooded. So no one had a blueprint of what to do for him. As a result, um, his lung collapsed and he passed away on that Monday. When the nurses came to clean him up, our I, I didn't let him. I wanted to do my job. I'm still struck by how many of those folks stayed with us. And these folks were, they were there. <laughs> and they were just, they were putting other people before them and their own families. And it, and it still just makes me emotional to think about how blessed we are. Being responsible for a number of people during this crisis vulnerable people, many with high support needs, added stress to workers already exhausted. We were trying to be strong for the consumers, plus we were about our own family members that didn't evacuate with us. We just tried to comfort each other, be strong for each other, and the consumers at the same time. That was pretty hard to do. At this time, everyone was hurting. Community and family ties were strained. The people whose very job was to provide support were now those in need of support. It was really hard on me, trying to keep it together. I couldn't break. If I broke, then my staff would have broke, they would have panicked, then my consumers would have panicked, and, you know, we would have fell apart, so. As the floodwaters receded, people slowly returned to New Orleans. Military helicopters were flying overhead, and it was hard to think because of the sound. 
anybody who lives down here that their world has been turned upside down. The smell of the city as we arrived was unbearable. It smelled rotten. The whole city smelled rotten. Everything that the water touched was dead. You didn't want to breathe. I lost everything I had. It was terrifying to come back to see that I have nothing to go back to and nowhere to go. This used to be a nice neighborhood. Not now. This was my living room. They had nine feet of water in here. This was me and my wife's room. This was all our clothes. The damage from up here, it wasn't maybe a color piece of the ceiling was down, a color piece of the wall was down, but everything else was from people coming in here, looters coming in here, just took what they wanted to take. An added role for direct support professionals was finding housing for the people they supported and for themselves. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, was providing trailers to those who had lost their homes, but the trailers proved difficult to obtain. Hundreds sat unused in other states, while people struggled to find affordable accommodations. I wanted to come back to the job, but I didn't have anywhere to stay because the rent was $2,800 for a two-bedroom house. So I started out sleeping in the parking lot in my car, trying to work and running back and forth to Texas, trying to take care of my son with not enough money. Time to time, when I think about it, it may be a little depressing. And, but all in all, I'm, I'm happy because I'm blessed that I was able to make it out. The most important thing is, is my life, you know, and I think about the people that didn't make it. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a big issue for the folks in this area, especially folks who experienced it firsthand. The loss people experienced at this time was profound, but the need to go on and the sheer scale of work in rebuilding homes and communities provided focus. For DSPs who returned to New Orleans, moving on often meant working more than one job while trying to rebuild their lives. The 17th Street Canal brought about 12 feet of water in the area, 10 of it coming into my house. I was okay with it up until I had to gut out my children's room. With so many workers unable to return to New Orleans, the duties of direct support professionals multiplied. DSPs assisted more people at a time, and new hires often lacked the experience and training to work effectively. The labor market value for workers in the metropolitan area is like anywhere from $11 to $15. So a direct support worker can go and work for any retail business and make a lot more money than they can make working with people with developmental disabilities and their families. I have a staff that's been with us 16 years. You ask her what her pay is. It is $7.45 an hour after 16 years. That's not right. You know, she got to love what she do. We here in New Orleans need to keep reminding ourselves that we are in this for the long haul. We all tend to think in terms of days and hours, and this is 10, 15, 20 years. For the approximately 750,000 people working as direct support professionals nationally, the pay is extremely low, especially when considering the high level of skill and responsibility required. There is a career path for DSPs with opportunities for advancement, but such options are not available in all agencies and communities, and many DSPs enjoy the jobs they have. You know, some people say, well, you can't do better. You know, you should go back to school. Some people actually love what they do. This hurricane has made it abundantly clear to us, if it wasn't clear before, that direct support professionals have got to be recognized as the important part of the labor force that they are. 
To fulfill the promise of making our communities welcoming places for people with disabilities, it will require a well-trained workforce of committed direct support professionals who receive livable wages. Is this going to be a better city for people with disabilities? I hope so.